we are back, and better, we are back with Bomani Jones, the host of HBO's Game Theory, maybe the smartest person in sports, and certainly the one that nobody wants to get into a real debate with because he'll turn him into he'll turn him into cold cuts. Bo, thank you for coming. Welcome. Hey man, how are you guys doing? Well, so far so good. We haven't said anything incredibly stupid, but it's early yet. Good start. Good start. Yeah. How are you doing? What you got? Hey man, not too bad over here. Just trying to make a TV show. You know that that, that gets in the way of living sometimes, but we're gonna make it. Is uh, is it easier this year than last year? Is it harder? Are there more people trying to tell you how to do this, or fewer people trying to tell you how to do? This? Oh man, I think that. When something sticks around, it's an insight into a level of investment that a number of people then have in it. Uh, people who invest like to speak and have say. Like, it makes perfect sense. So you get a little bit more of that, but I think it gets harder just once you get a better handle of what is possible, then your grind turns into something different because now you can see it. Like, before, to me, this was just like, oh, get to do a TV show. Cool. Now it's like, hey, so what exactly can we make this into? And there's a little more that comes with that. Bomani, we're going to get these out. You know, we got to talk local real quick, but there's so much we want to get into and, and talk to you about. But real quick, I, I did want to ask you, from what you have seen in terms of the Warriors, how many Western Conference teams right now would you pick over the Warriors to win the whole thing? Well, I mean, we're operating on the assumption of healthy step, right? So if we are operating with that assumption, I still don't think that this particular incarnation of the Warriors plays defense like the previous ones had, and that's what's going to wind up being the issue. So could they play enough defense, say, if they got in the play-in and then caught Denver in the first round? Do I think they play enough defense to win that? No, I don't. Um, but I think once you start getting below like that top three, Anything goes in the West. I got no idea how much better anybody in the West is than each other between, like, 3 and 12. Do you have a lot of faith in Phoenix because it has Kevin Durant or a lot of faith in Dallas because it went out and got Kyrie Irving? Or is that just more noise that makes those spots 4 through 12 more confusing? Yeah, I don't have a lot of faith, but the idea of Devin Booker on one wing and Kevin Durant on the other has got to be terrifying, right? <laughs> like, what are you supposed to do with that? Or if you wind up in a situation with Devin Booker handling the ball and Kevin Durant setting the, the ball screen, like that's got to be scary. So I do think they matter. D uh, Dallas, I don't lean nearly as much on that side. But with both teams, the question to me comes down to whether or not it's a chemistry experiment. And Phoenix, we saw fall apart last year in large part because they were a chemistry experiment gone wrong. What happens this year? That's the question. But I, I, if, if Phoenix is rolling, I can't see anybody really picking against him. I, I do think that the Chris Paul piece and how earlier in the season there were there were rumors about, oh, the, the Suns think that Chris Paul's on the way down, which obviously he is, so... The Suns, if they're rolling, it's going to be tough. Bo, I, I wanted to ask you about last night, Brandon Miller, Alabama, this whole situation with the with the gun and not being charged. What's your take on it? How do you think it was handled? I know you, you talk a lot about your Texas teams and the SEC. How did you think everything went down? And I mean, it's not over yet, but how do you see it all? Well, I don't think that uh, Nate Oates, the coach at Alabama, handled this particularly well. But, And I think I personally have trouble relating to the circumstance under which somebody's like, hey, could you bring me my gun right fast? You're like, cool, be right there. Right. Um, like, like there's, there, there's something there that doesn't land with me. Like, I just don't know how that ever comes up. But it appears that there was no crime. Right, at least as far as local law enforcement is saying it, there was no crime. So what exactly is the punishment for doing something really, really stupid? And it comes down to the question of, do you think Brandon Miller knew he was taking the gun for somebody to get shot? Now, to me, guns are for shooting people, so I don't know what else you would be taking a gun to somebody for. But in this crazy, wild world of guns, we make the assumption that, hey, having a gun isn't a bad thing necessarily, obviously, because otherwise people wouldn't be allowed to actually have them. 
So I don't know what exactly it is that they're supposed to do under the circumstance. I just know when it involves a college player and a handgun comes up, you're not going to handle this right if that dude still keeps playing. But I don't know, like, can people clearly articulate what their problem is with it? I know it feels bad, but if you ask people to put into words what the problem is, I don't think they could do that well at it. Let me ask the layup that follows up. Do you think this affects his draft status in any way, shape, or form? Uh, It could affect his draft status if it's really close between him and somebody else to be like the number one pick in the draft. Guess what? It's not. That's over. It's not even close for him being the number two pick in the draft. That one's over, too. So, no, they'll get in there. They'll do the interviews. They'll talk to him. Somebody will explain to him, you can't do nothing this stupid ever again, and then they'll keep it moving. So basically, if he's not going to get charged and his draft position isn't significantly affected, this is almost, and I hate to put it this way because it's there's a murder involved, but for for his purposes, it's almost no harm, no foul. Well, I would make the argument that He's got to live with whatever it is that he did. And so we very often look for the external punishment in these cases. But let's say he brought a gun to somebody and he knew that they were going to kill somebody. He's going to have to live with that. If he did that and he didn't know, I imagine that's probably even harder for him to live with. Right? Like this was just really, really, really stupid. So, I don't think it's no harm, no foul in the larger macro sense, because I do think that we're still dealing with a human being that I assume has some measure of conscience. I would I would hope so. And I would imagine so. Bo, you know, you you got in the weeds as you as you typically do from time to time. I shouldn't say typically. And all you did was bring up stuff about Carl Malone that should have already been common knowledge. A couple questions on that. Number one. How do you think the whole NBA All-Star Game weekend ended up, including that piece of it? And number two, are there any other stories out there that are common knowledge, like the Carl Malone one, that you feel have been swept under the rug a little bit for whatever reason? Well, I would make the argument that this is not common knowledge. And mm. I think that's something that people who follow sports very closely can often lose sight of is that this is something that we know because we follow this all the time. Most people just watch games, right? Like yeah. most people are just in it to watch a game and then keep it moving. So I don't think there are that many people who knew this. This became a story in 2007 because the young man that was um, conceived when Carl Malone had sex with a 13-year-old, um, he went into the NFL draft. And so there were stories around his story that went from there. And then the later things you would see come up about it were about how Malone had established a relationship with this young man after not being in his life. Because we did not explicitly, in the year 2007, I think it was when this came out, we were much more reluctant to explicitly call something like that rape. That's just not what we did. We just, like, you think about the Jerry Lee Lewis story. People really looked at the cousin part as being the problem far more than the fact that it was a child. Like, the sensibilities that people have changed. And so when this came up, I just don't think it was a big story before. And then I'm out there, and they asked me the question about it. And I'm like, yeah, it is kind of awkward because those of us who know this about Carl Malone know it. But it'll probably pass after the weekend goes. And the reason it'll pass after the weekend goes is because Carl Malone's not up in our faces. Mm -hmm. Right. Like if Carl Malone was somebody that was always trying to be around, then you could be like, hey, this is a problem. He showed up for one weekend. The NBA figured we could live through it and we could get past. And they were right. He's going to go back to the country, doing whatever the hell it is he do down there. (laughs) And nobody's going to think about him. Now, off the top of my head, there's almost an irony to the question that you asked, because it's hard for me to say what's something that's common knowledge and also swept under the rug. Those two things can't really exist at the same time. But I think a lot of things, there are so many things for people to keep up with that go on right now. Expecting people to remember something that they found out about 15 years ago and we just kept it moving. Mm -hmm. I think that's a lot to ask out of people. We're talking with Bomani Jones, the host of HBO's Game Theory. And you just raised an interesting point in my head, which is how many things are going on now. Do you ever wake up in the morning and say, I don't know what we're going to talk about. 
or is it is the job for you now is trying to figure out what of the many things that are landing on your desk are going to make the show? Yeah, it was actually funny because I was um, doing my podcast uh, today, recorded today with Dominique Foxworth, and we started with, uh, I don't know what we're going to talk about, and then those 45 to 50 minutes just ran through so fast. It was like, oh, we're sure we'll get to something, and then we go from there. Like, we have overload on things there are to talk about. What's wild, though, and I guess somewhat disappointing is what you try to do in this space is find a thing that everybody wants to talk about, and that's typically the dumbest things in the world, which is to say that Dominique and I started by talking about Aaron Rodgers. Oh, please go on. <laughs> I mean, I have to admit, right, I'm kind of intrigued by the idea of the darkness retreat. Like, like once I stopped and thought about it, I was like, wow, that's kind of interesting. Why? Wow, you going to be there nothing to do but think for four straight days. And in a way, I was like, yo, that does sound a little bit terrifying. And Aaron Rodgers said it would sound terrifying. And then suddenly I was like, oh, okay. What I think is amazing is the idea that somebody would say to themselves, yeah, I got to go in there and decide if I want $60 million or not. Like, I mean, I've done a darkness retreat before. Let me make that point clear. I definitely did a darkness retreat. And all I was thinking about was how the hell I was going to get the money up to pay that light bill. That was it. <laughs> like, this is a whole different sort of thing that he's doing. Um. Given the fact that we love to overblow stuff with Aaron Rodgers anyway, how much of that do you sense, and this is not a fair question to ask, but you asked for this, how much of him is now performative and how much of him do you think is genuine? I do think that he knows at this point that he can mess with us. Right? Like, some of his critiques of media are actually on point. And some of the things he says are like, ah, no, 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 I got to admit, you might have a point there. He's just so smug about it that it becomes so problematic. But he is very aware of the fact that he can do this, and then we'll all jump all over it. And I do think that he finds it entertaining uh, to be able to do those things. I also think that he believes some crazy things. I think all of these things have happened. Like, the thing I do appreciate about Aaron Rodgers is at least he's not boring, and just about every other quarterback in the NFL is boring. At least he is not. And I do think that most of the things he says he does actually believe. Um, we have a colorful character. It would just be better if he wasn't smug. Like, that's the same thing with him and Kyrie. There was a time where I could really enjoy a Kyrie type, except for the fact that he takes himself so damn seriously. Yeah, and well, and here's the thing, but well, first of all, I read that you could technically Aaron Rodgers where he was staying, the light, everything was working there. He could turn the lights on if he wanted. Now, obviously, we're assuming that he didn't, but it's not as if I don't know. It kind of hit me a certain type of way because it's not as if he literally was in the darkness. If he said, hey, I've had enough, we will never know. And I don't think you turned the light on. But the fact that he could, and you're talking about your darkness retreat, retreat where you couldn't, you know, there, there's just different levels of these retreats. But sticking with Aaron Rodgers and bringing it to the Bay Area, whether it's Aaron Rodgers, Trey Lance, or Brock Purdy, if you're the Niners and you can make the money work in any type of way, even if you got to move somebody, are you interested in Aaron Rodgers? And what are your thoughts on, you know, this battle we have right now between Trey Lance and Brock Purdy, who some people want to ship Trey Lance out right now and give Brock Purdy the gold jacket. Some people want to do the exact opposite. Where are you at on all that for the Niners QB situation? Well, one, I don't think you trade for Aaron Rodgers if for no other reason than like, this is the team that traded DeForest Buckner away, got the first-round pick. And what do you know? You get Ken Law. It's almost like DeForest Buckner wasn't here. Like, they actually know what to do with picks. And so if you actually know what to do with them, then I think you probably should hold on to them. To me, I don't think the 49ers have a dilemma at all at quarterback. If Brock Purdy can do that in this offense, I can't wait to see what Trey Lance does. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how in the world that is not the immediate response that people have here. Uh, in this quarterback starved league that we've got, that dude was the last pick in the draft, the very last one. And what he did this season was very impressive considering. But I am absolutely going into training camp if I'm the 49ers like, yo, I'm giving Trey Lance every opportunity to win this job. And if he doesn't, then he doesn't, and we go to Brock Purdy. Anything else to me is stupid. Like, 
You know what? I'm going to go with the way less talented guy over the one that we traded three first-round picks to get. Hell no. Trey, you got every chance to do this. And if you can't, then we move on. But damn it, we got to try. Brock Purdy did not earn a starting job. That is not how jobs work. He had it for a little while. Way to go. Yeah. Well, it depends who you ask out here, Bamani. One more, one more note. This isn't even really a question. It's kind of a question. Just going back to Aaron Rodgers quickly. Please tell me I'm not crazy. Does Aaron Rodgers to you, doesn't it look like he enjoys the offseason more than playing football at this point? When he sits up there and he's doing the Pat McAfee show, he, you could just tell he was he is so excited for the offseason and everybody gets to wonder where he's going. I honestly think at this point in his career, he enjoys this part of the season, the offseason, more than the actual season. Well, I think the thing about the actual season for him that we have to keep in mind is that he's 40 years old. Mm-hmm. Nobody else on that team is 40 years old. You know, like this happens to guys where they get to that point where they look around and they're like, yo, there's nobody my age to hang out with. Like I can see how the team dynamic and everything else at this point wouldn't necessarily be that much fun to me. Now, what he's got with McAfee that is really interesting, I don't think that people recognize just how many people listen to Pat McAfee and watch that show. Like that is a legitimate juggernaut um, in what I would call non-traditional media sector. So like, It's not over the air, so you don't think about it that way, but that's the one dude that's getting all these viewers. And, yes, Aaron Rodgers is lapping up all the attention because his appearance on that show has become a destination sort of thing for people in our industry who then go and ultimately amplify the message. But I find to be interested about his spots on McAfee, and I'm just guessing here. I watch some of those, and I'm like, he has no idea that Pat McAfee is messing with him, too. Like, like you can see the look on McAfee's face sometimes. Like, did he just say that? Yeah. And he'll just throw something else out there, and Aaron Rodgers will just keep on going. <laughs> That's why I wonder if this isn't more performative, that he's almost working off a mental script. But No, 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 no. Let me tell you, if this is performative, he's in the wrong line of work. He can make $60 million without getting hit in the kidneys if he's that good an actor. Well, that's true, but Tom Brady could have done that too, and he still wanted to do it. There must be some yeah. heroin in playing the game that I don't get. Um, oh, man, I just want these old guys to go away, though. Like, you're, our sports consumption is not intended for these guys this age to still stay at the forefront. Like, it's my same thing with LeBron James. He's a top 10 player. He's still really good, but he should be gone. Like, the last eight teams that were left in the playoffs, all of them had quarterbacks under 30. Why are these old dudes still here? Excellent point. Take them out and shoot them. I'm good with that. Um, speaking of quarterbacks, while I, I'm always annoyed by the basic tyranny of evaluating entire teams by simply their quarterback, I tend to wonder from time to time whether or not Patrick Mahomes has ruined evaluating quarterbacks because he's such an outlier and he's such a unicorn and nobody else either can match his skill set or his improbability. Do you view it the same way that people have a hard time looking at a good quarterback and figuring out how good they are just because there's Mahomes out there doing things that nobody else has done? Well, I actually think that in this day and age, they might be better at evaluating quarterbacks than ever. It's going to be a little bit convoluted, but I ask you to follow me. So, I mentioned all those quarterbacks being under 30. Lost in our discussions really is that there's a lost generation of quarterbacks. Like, if you think about it, the best quarterbacks in the league this year who were over 30 were Geno Smith and Kirk Cousins. Like, how exactly does that happen? And it happens when it takes people forever to figure out, you know, you probably need a quarterback that can move. Mm -hmm. That would probably be a helpful thing to have. And the game reached a point where you couldn't make it anymore without a quarterback who could not move, but the evaluation process had not caught up to that, and now you wind up looking around and seeing all these young, incredibly talented quarterbacks, and you realize, wow, they were literally doing it all wrong for about 15 years, all like 10 to 15 years in this league and finding guys. And so it's going to be interesting to see how we deal with it in this draft because you got Bryce Young, who's too small, but probably the most perfect prospect of those if you just look at his skills, right? T.J. Stroud, who I don't have a great reason for why you should not take C.J. Stroud. 
Anthony Richardson, who is basically Josh Allen 2018 in terms of how you evaluate him in the draft, except he's more polished and played against a higher level of competition. And then Will Levis, who honestly I personally only know that he's white. I don't want to evaluate his game. I need to check it out. But I get a little bit nervous when it's a guy I've never heard of and people are telling me that he's the best. And it's not like he went to school off the beaten path. He played in the SEC. I've seen that game happen before also. But now, they, when they get out here and look for white dudes, they actually require them to be fast now. You notice that? Even the, he, Brock Purdy, he can move. They're not letting white dudes get away with standing still while everybody else got to be fast, you see? So now, I think they're going to get better because they're actually looking at people who can play quarterback in the NFL when they willfully were doing the opposite. Mm. And finally, before we let you go, because we've kept you, well, you kept you 20 minutes that you could have done something useful with. Uh, is there anything about baseball in 2023 that is on your radar, even even remotely? Or is that a sport that, frankly, is sto- so stuck in being unable to figure out what it is or what it wants to be that it almost doesn't gain your notice? Well, I think baseball's problem is that the game is not compatible with national coverage and our overload of stuff that we have right now. You follow baseball by following one team for 162 grueling games. Like, you find that, you know, the whole league by the end, you know, everybody's bullpen and all of that. But it's not meant for you to follow the two leagues as one league. It doesn't work in that way. It just can't hold attention like that. They do great on television numbers locally, but people don't show up to games. And it's not part of the national consciousness because there's not a national discussion to be had about baseball. However, I do live in New York now, and I am very intrigued by the idea that we got this, uh, I think, alleged, maybe convicted, I can't remember, but I'm going to say alleged for the time being, white-collar criminal who owns the Mets, and he is just like, I'm going to spend all the money I can on my baseball team, and we need more guys like that out here, everywhere. Like, I want him to turn this into the strip club for baseball. Show, make these people feel bad about themselves and how they act as rich people and show them they ain't no real ballers because you out here spending real money. I'm here for it. I like that. I love because that. Because I've also fallen in love with the guy who owns the Philadelphia Phillies who came out the other day and said, you know, why does anybody care You know, what we make? Nobody remembers how much the 27 Yankees made or the, or the Big Red Machine made financially. They just wanted to know, were they a good team or not? And that's what I'm doing. And he spent as much money in the time he's owned the team as Steve Cohen has. So maybe there are a few guys on the periphery that are starting to figure that out, too. Yeah, the guy in San Diego, right? Like the idea that that market has the players that it has and is willing to extend the capital in order to do that. Like baseball's better with a sign brand, right? Like it's better when you have more of those people. But more than anything else, if we all create a world where these dudes can make these billions of dollars, the least they can do is spend it on baseball players. What a dandy thought. But then again, that's what you traffic in, dandy thoughts. Bo, you were great, as always. Uh, continued good luck killing people with the show. And uh, thanks for spending some time with us. And uh, we'll talk soon. All right, gentlemen. You have a good one. All righty. Great stuff. He's so good, I hate him. <laughs> He just, literally, there's nothing that stumps him.